Katie at Cult Beginnings in Dublin, Ohio, and today we're going to do another Bernina training video. This is basically exactly what we go through in class with our new Bernina owners, and we're excited to bring it to you so you can watch it from your home. In this video, we're going to focus on all of the sewing side of the Bernina machines. This video is going to apply to your Bernina 4 series, 5 series, 7, or 8 series machine. The icons might be in a little bit of a different place than they are on this 770, but all of the buttons, the features, the functions, those images, they're going to be the exact same. Our students, when they come into class, they love this class because it really enables them to use their Bernina to the fullest potential on the sewing side of things. There are tons of decorative stitches, different editing features, lots of different stuff that we're going to go over. So let's dive right in. So to begin, let's talk a little bit about different, different ways that you can do a tie-on or a tie-off as you are sewing. You always have the option with any of your Bernina machines of using the quick reverse button. So that's if you are just start your sewing seam and you press the quick reverse button, which is the physical button on the front of the machine that's like a backwards U. If you touch that button, it's gonna sew backwards as long as you hold it. So some people like to sew forwards five stitches, touch that button, sew backwards a few stitches, and then keep going. There are some other ways that you can do a tie on though. We talked about one in our settings. If you go into your settings, you go into your sewing settings, this option here is your automatic tie-on every time that you sew. So if I turn it on so there's a green eye, it's going to start with a tie-on every time that I start to sew. I usually like to have it off if I'm doing chain piecing or quilting or things like that, but there might be a time, if I X out of here, that I do want to have a tie-on for this particular stitch. In order to do that, I can go into my eye menu and touch my tie-on button. A little icon appears showing that when I start to sew, it's going to do a little tie-on at the beginning of that seam. On the 790 and the 880, this tie-on button is actually a physical button on the side of your machine, but it works just the same way. I can turn it off just by touching that button again, and then I will no longer have a tie-on at the beginning of my seam. Another way that I can do a tie-on and then a tie-off at the end is actually with stitch number five. You can see it has a little zigzag at the beginning and the end, and that means that it's designed to do a tie-on and a tie-off. If I start to sew with this stitch, it's going to do five stitches forward, five stitches backwards, and then continue sewing forwards. When I'm ready to tie off at the end, I just have to tap my quick reverse button on the front of my machine, and it's going to do another five stitches backwards, and I don't have to hold that button down in order to make it do that tie-off. That is a very convenient feature if I know that I'm going to do a tie-off at the end of a seam. One other stitch that is designed for a tie-on and a tie-off is the quilter's securing program. So this stitch number five, that's really five full stitches forward and five full stitches backwards. So it's going to give you a little bit of bulk at that beginning and end of the seam. Another way you can do it is if we go into search for stitch 1329. This is going to be stitch number 1301 for the 4 and 5 series, and actually it's 1324 for the 7. This stitch, if I close out of my magnifying glass, this stitch has little dots at the beginning and little dots at the end. Those are actually going to be tiny running stitches in place, so instead of doing 5 forward and 5 backwards, it's going to do a little what they call a quilter's knot. So just little tiny stitches in place, kind of traveling forward so you don't get the bulk, but your seam is secured. This stitch is going to do that tie on at the beginning and then when I am ready to end my seam or my quilting path or whatever it is that I'm doing, I just tap my quick reverse button which is the U-turn on the front of the machine. I tap that button once and it's going to do those five tie off stitches, little running stitches, and be done with the seam. So those are some different ways that I can tie on and tie off all within the context of my sewing side. So let's talk a little bit more about reverse. In any case, I can always, always, always press and hold the manual button on the front of my machine, and as long as I'm holding that button, when I press it in, the image on my screen is going to show that I'm stitching backwards. As soon as I let go, it's going to go forwards again. But if I want to sew backwards for any length of time, it's very annoying to do that by holding a button, so I have what's called a permanent reverse option. In any of the stitches, I can go into my eye menu 
and just engage the permanent reverse right on my screen. I can see that I'm sewing backwards, and as long as it's showing that it's sewing backwards, I'm gonna sew backwards the whole time. To disengage, I just touch the button again, and I can see that I'm sewing forwards once more. We also have a backstepping option. So this funny, funny little icon is the backstepping option. And that's where the machine is actually going to remember the last 200 stitches that it has taken. This is really handy if I X out of here and say I go into my honeycomb. If you are sewing along on this honeycomb and you happen to have a thread break, or you run out of bobbin thread, or something happens where you take a few stitches but you don't actually make a stitch, you can re-thread, go into your eye, engage back stepping, make sure it's sewing backwards, and you can actually just stitch back to meet the last honeycomb that you successfully stitched. So it's really handy for thread breaks. It's also very handy if you are doing um, decorative stitching and you want the stitching to show up a little bit more bold. So let's talk a little bit more about stitch editing. This is the really fun stuff. So now we are gonna go to stitch 1329 on a seven and eight series or 1309 on a four and five series. This is the basic blanket stitch. Really, really handy if you're doing applique or any time that you would want a blanket stitch. To get out of this search menu, I just touch my magnifying glass and I see exactly where that stitch shows up on my screen. So this blanket stitch is probably one that you're going to have a lot of ideas on customization. This is the default where it's gonna tell me it's 2.3 millimeters wide, 2.6 millimeters long. I can always use my multifunction knobs on the side of my machine to adjust the stitch width and stitch length. Or if I know a specific number that I want to go for, I really almost always use the multifunction knobs, but if you're very particular, you can always touch that number and just go up by 0.1 at a time or down, either direction. Just like always, if I see that there's a yellow box around some feature on the machine, if I touch it, it's going to go back to the default. I can X out of this option and do the same thing for the stitch length. I can adjust it by just 0.5 increments up and down, or I can touch what's yellow and it's going to set it back to the default. When I X out of that, then I can go into my I menu and do some other customizations. So let's say that I do want to use my multifunction knobs to make it a little bit wider and a little bit longer, but then I usually want to sew around my appliques the other direction. I can use this icon here. This is a triangle that's flipping from left to right. When I touch that, I get a mirror image of the blanket stitch on my screen. This might be exactly what I'm looking for with my blanket stitch, and I can just leave this here, and we'll see that the machine is going to remember it for as long as it's turned on. It's stored in temporary altered memory. So when we come back later, all these stitch settings are still going to be here as long as the machine is turned on. We'll talk about some other ways that memory functions in a little bit in this video. So now if we want to do another kind of examining of stitch editing ideas, let's X out of this one and we'll go search for a satin stitch. I really like stitch 401 and I hit the green check. That's these satin triangles. I'm gonna get out of my search menu and I can see all the other satins that I have in this folder in my decorative stitches. If I go into my eye menu, now I can use my vertical up down flip. If I touch that, my triangles have turned vertically and mirror imaged that direction. I can still use my multifunction knobs to adjust the width, but with satin stitches, when I adjust the length, you can see that the length of the whole decoration is lengthened and the stitch density has not stayed the same. It actually keeps the same number of stitches but has made it longer to match whatever I've told it with my increased length. Maybe I don't like that. Maybe I just want longer triangles but I don't want them to be less dense like they are now. I'm going to go ahead and touch my stitch length and touch what's yellow to put it back to default. X out of there. And then back in my I menu, I can play with what's called elongation. So on a satin stitch, this option is going to be available. It's not going to be available on a non-satin stitch because it's not going to do anything in those cases. But if we touch on elongation, I can really play with the pattern extension, with how long those triangles are. 
So now, if I go up by 1% at a time, you can see some small changes on the screen, or I can even go up by 100% at a time. And you'll see that the stitch density stays the same, no matter how long I make those triangles. It takes it a moment to kind of reset, because it actually is calculating exactly where every one of those stitches is going to go. I can also play with stitch density here. So this indicator here, the 0.3 millimeters, that is how many millimeters in between each stitch. So as I increase, it's going to increase the number of millimeters between each stitch. And so you can see my stitch density is decreasing as I increase this number. And I can get some really cute little Christmas trees um, and I can sew them. They're going to look exactly how they look on my screen. So I get that stitch preview where I can audition density and elongation and I don't have to sew it out until I'm pretty close to where I want to be. I'm going to use my breadcrumbs up here to go back into my eye menu. And now we can talk about pattern repeat. So say that I just want one Christmas tree stitched out on my project. To do that, I have this triangle with the X. That X kind of stands for infinity. It's going to keep sewing until I stop. When I touch it once, it turns to one. On the 570 and the 590, you actually can go up to 99 pattern repeats. It's going to pop up a little screen where you can tell it how many repeats you want. But on most of the other machines, as you touch the machine on that indicator, it's going to keep increasing this number and you will see exactly how many it's going to stitch. I would definitely suggest trying this out on your machine. So get some fabric, find a decorative stitch, and touch this to say two, three, or four repeats. When you sew, you just keep your foot pressed all the way to the floor on your foot control. And as you keep that down, it's going to stitch out. You'll watch this bouncing ball and it's going to move through all of your different patterns. And this number is going to count down until it gets to the very end of one. And then it's going to stop, even if you have your foot control still pressed down because it knows exactly how many repeats you wanted to do. You also can use your go button, which is the green button on the front of your machine. If you press and hold that button, your machine will Start sewing and it's going to sew exactly as many repeats as you told it that you wanted. In any case, if I've made all these changes and I just want to get back to the default, I can touch the clear button and everything goes back to exactly the way that it was. So now let's X out of our I menu and let's go back to that stitch 1329, our blanket stitch that we were playing with before. On the four and five series, this is stitch 1309. So I touch 1329, and you can see that everything is still yellow exactly how we left it before, because I haven't turned the machine off yet. But say that I know, I'm gonna close out of this, I know that I always want my blanket stitch to be just like this, that no matter what kind of project I'm working on, this is my favorite blanket stitch. If I go into my I menu, I can actually save these settings in what's called permanently altered memory. So it's the machine is always going to have temporary memory where as long as it's on, it's going to remember what I've told it. But if I just touch this floppy disk, these are now considered the new default settings for the stitch. And I can turn the machine off and when I turn it back on, they are still going to be exactly how I've put them. Now, if I make other changes, so say that I do alter the weight, the width or the length, when I hit the clear button, it's going to put it back to the default that I've now set. This is my new default for the blanket stitch. You can see that it still shows in yellow, so I know that it's not the factory default, but it is my new default and it's always going to remember it. If I ever want to clear that, I can touch the clear button and it puts it back to the factory default settings. Now there may be times where I have a specific blanket stitch that I want for some products or some projects, but not for others. And so I might want to have a collection of different blanket stitches, and I don't always want them to be that specific one. Then I can use my favorites. So there are some really easy ways just to save this stitch into memory, um, whether it's temporary, whether it's permanent, or into my favorites. So let's make a few changes. We'll adjust the width and the length. And now I'm going to X out of my I menu. I want to save these exact uh, specifications into my favorites, which is my heart icon at the bottom right. When I touch my heart icon, I have a few different options that come up. The first one is to take stitches up out of the folder. 
The next one is what we want to do to save stitches down into the folder. So I touch on that icon and I have four different folders that I can pick from. These are all identical folders. They might make sense to you to organize your stitches however you'd like, but I usually just put things in folder one. You can see I already had a decorative stitch in there from before. And this is basically saying, here's a yellow square around the stitch I'm going to save in. It's asking, are you sure? Well, yes, I am. And now that stitch with those settings are saved in my folder. If I wanted to go take it out of the folder, I touch that top icon and I can pull up any of my previous favorites. You can save a very large number of favorites into these folders. If you go back into this breadcrumb and we look at that saving in feature, I'm at 98% of my memory. I have never gotten to even you know, 50%. You can really save a whole lot of stitches here so you don't have to worry about running out of room on the machine. I'm gonna use my breadcrumb to go back. But now say that I accidentally saved that. I don't actually want it there. I wanna delete it. That's what my trash can is for. So I use my trash can. I know that I'm in folder one because that's just easier for me to remember. And it's saying, which of these did you want to delete? We'll go ahead and delete the blanket stitch. And now it says, okay, are you sure? And this is where we hit the green check. You'll see that it d deletes and disappears. And that's how I can navigate my favorites folder. If I go back up into my decorative stitches, I'm kind of back exactly where I was. There's one other feature inside of the I menu that can be very handy. Let's go up into our utility stitches and I'm going to go to our double overlock number 10. Sometimes, depending on what kind of fabric you're using, what kind of thread, what sort of system you're using, the stitch may not stitch out exactly like it looks on the screen there. You might get just a little bit different results and you want to fine tune them or fine tune the appearance of the stitch. In that case, you're going to use what's called stitch balance. So I might have to scroll to get to stitch balance. And on the screen, it's showing a little image of denim. It's showing this is what your stitch looks like on the fabric itself. And all that you do is you kind of match this stitch image to what you're actually getting as the result. And it's going to make the necessary adjustments within the machine to change the stitch out to get actually what you're looking for. So balance is not something that I use very often, but it's really used for fine tuning stitch appearance, depending on what results you're getting. On some of the other models, you can also do a left right skew. So you might have a couple of different options here. In every case, you just want to match this stitch image to what you're actually getting on your stitch out. And then the machine is going to make the adjustments necessary to alter the stitch and give you the results that you're looking for. The next thing that I want to talk about is buttonholes. Buttonholes are so fun on the Bernina because they are just as painless as possible. So when I go into my buttonhole menu and I select stitch 51, this is just a standard buttonhole, what I can do here if I go into my eye menu is set my buttonhole length more easily than I've almost ever seen it before. So if I touch buttonhole length, what I want to do now is actually get the button that I'm going to be sewing the buttonhole for and use my multifunction knobs to match the yellow circle to exactly the size of the button. You can see that it's telling me this is a 15 millimeter button, but the buttonhole, it's already gonna add that flex for me. It's going to add two millimeters so that there's room to get that button through. So I match my button exactly to the, the width of that circle and it's going to sew the exact right length of buttonhole. I can use my eye breadcrumb to go back into the menu and I can also adjust my buttonhole width opening. So as I make adjustments here, you see that the opening between the two beads is getting wider or skinnier, depending on what I'm looking for. Lots of customization options there. If I close out of my eye menu, I can still make stitch length and stitch width adjustments. So now using my multifunction knob, the top one is going to make my beads wider and wider. The bottom one, my stitch length, is going to make my bead density either less dense or more dense, depending on what appearance of buttonhole I'm looking for. So you can see that by altering my 
buttonhole length, my bead width, my actual stitch width and length, I have four different ways that I can really customize every one of these buttonholes and make them exactly how I want them to look. Just like before, I can save these in my favorites. So I might have a series of different buttonholes that I'm interested in, and I can save all of them in a buttonhole folder and easily put them in by selecting that in folder. Maybe my buttonholes are gonna be in folder number two or wherever I want to put them. Hit the check mark, and then I have my saved buttonhole that I can retrieve whenever I need to make another buttonhole. So now let's talk about combination mode. A lot of people want to know how can I make my sewing machine stitch letters for a quilt label, things like that. If you have embroidery, you're definitely going to want to do this on the embroidery side of things. But for a sewing only, it can be really, really nice to do different decorative stitch combinations, either with decorative stitches or with letters. So to activate combination mode, I just touch the plus on my screen. And you'll see that all the stitches go away because right now I have nothing in my combination. Certain stitches are not available in combination mode. So this tie off stitch that we were looking at before, that is not available because it is never going to do a tie on kind of in the middle of the combination. So the machine is gonna let you know which options you have to put into your combination. I usually will go into my squiggle, which is my decorative stitches, and I might pick flowers or things like that to kind of start out the combination. Whatever stitch I touch, it's going to put a single image of that stitch on the screen. So it's saying that the combination right now is just one of those flowers. Then maybe I want to add a different type of flower, 104. So now I have the first flower and then the second different type of flower and they're just connected as normal. Right now, my combination would be to stitch the little daisy and then the little tulip just back and forth and back and forth again and again. But maybe this is where I can use some creativity and I can say, no, I wanna put a daisy, a tulip, and then Bernina, right? I can put any kind of letters in the combination as well. So we'll go into our alphabet. And we'll go into one of our alphabet folders. And this can be a little bit difficult to manage um, if you're trying to put an entire word or entire sentence. So that's where I'll use my transition, which is this little arrow to the left. And I'll open up the full screen. I can see up top that I have my combination mode already starting. So it's the daisy, it's the tulip, and now I'm gonna be putting my letters. I'll put Bernina and I have the option of an all caps or I can switch to lowercase. I can scroll on my screen and touch the next letter. But say that I accidentally put two ends. That is not, well, that's the third end. It's not how you spell Bernina either way. I have my backspace key. I touch the backspace and it's going to delete that last letter that I just put. If I forgot to delete that and I accidentally put in Bernina, I can use this arrow here to highlight the previous letter, delete that letter, and then I have my word spelled correctly. I can close the transition with that, oops, I accidentally hit the A, so I'll just hit my backspace again. I can touch this little arrow and then I'm out of the transition and I'm back into the combination mode. Whatever is blue is sort of what's selected now. So I can use these arrows here to navigate. I can see that I have, I am on stitch number nine out of nine different stitches that I'm doing and I can use the arrow to go up through them all or I can touch my pattern begin. So I have this icon that's now showing up on my screen. It's a triangle with the line at the very top. On the 790 and 880, this is actually a button, a physical button on your machine, so you can always have the option of pressing it there. But here, now that it's up on the screen, if I touch it, it brings me back to the very beginning of the combination. What's nice now is I can actually edit each stitch individually. So whatever is blue is what I'll be editing. So say that I like this daisy, how it looks, but I might want to adjust the tulip. Just do something different with it. When I touch the I menu, this tulip is exactly what's going to be edited because it's blue. I can do a mirror image, so I flip it the other direction. I can use my multifunction knobs to maybe skinny it up or make it a little bit longer. 
I can do anything that we talked about just earlier in this video with editing that stitch, but I'm only doing it to the item that's in blue. Say that I don't like this tulip anymore and I wanted to get rid of it or I accidentally touched an item um, or a stitch and I put it in here and I didn't want it anymore. This I menu in combination mode also has my trash can. All I do is touch the trash can and that tulip is gone. I can use my arrows to go back to the beginning of that combination. And now let's say that I just want this to stitch out one time because I don't need it to say Bernina, Bernina, Bernina. Maybe I do, depending on what project I'm doing, but maybe I just want it to stitch a flower and Bernina one time. I'm still in my information menu and I'm going to touch this set of three squares on top of each other. That is my total selection option. So now you can see that everything is in blue and what I'm going to do here is going to impact the full combination. The only options that are available to me are the ones that are in light gray. So I can do a mirror image for the whole thing if I wanted to you know, do a combination one way and then flip it and do it the other way. Right now it's kind of backwards, so I'm gonna put it back to normal. And then I also have my pattern repeat option. This functions just like before, where if I touch it once and I get a number one, I can hold my foot control all the way down and I just let my machine sew until it stops on its own. It's going to stop on its own after a single repeat of this combination. I also have the option here of just scrapping everything and starting over. So if I touch this delete button, it's going to delete it all. So I'd be careful about touching that if you've put some work into your combination. Just like any of the other stitches, I can also save my combinations. So I'm going to use my breadcrumb to go back into my eye. I can see all of my different options here. Um, I'm kind of back into just editing my little daisy there. But I'm actually going to X out of here and go into my favorites, my personal program. You'll see first that I have an extra option here. I have um, the same folder as before where I can pull a decorative stitch that I've saved before. So in one, there's that star that we saw earlier. Alternatively, if I use my breadcrumb to go back and back to the heart, I can actually pull saved combinations out. So this second folder has three squares stacked on top of each other. Those are previous combinations. So I can pull previous combinations out. So we've had a Donna here before, we've had a Bernina here before. So this is kind of where I would go to pull my combinations out of memory. If I go back into the heart, this is also where I would go to save into a folder if I wanted to save this forever. And it's going to give me an image of that stitch along with all the other items that are in this folder. I hit the green check and now it's saved in that folder. Just like before, I have the option of deleting and kind of cleaning up my folders by going into my trash can. And it's going to say, well, what do I want to delete? We can delete what we've just put in there and say, yep, I'm sure. And now my folder is a little bit more cleaned up. I can close out of my favorites. And this is sort of my, my home screen where I'm able to sew this combination out. So as we talked about setting pattern repeats, there might be times when you want a long chain of stitching, of decorative stitching, and you just want to be sure that when you finish that one exact flower or heart or whatever it is, that's when it stops. You don't want to have to time out when you need to stop to get a complete stitch. So to show you how to do that, I'm going to go in to my decorative stitches and I'm going to pick these daisies. If I go ahead and lower my presser foot and start to stitch, this white circle is going to sort of show where in the stitch we are. Anytime that I'm sewing and I want to be done at the end of that flower, I can hit my pattern end button, which is the triangle with the lines at the bottom. That pattern end button we talked about in the settings video, you can program to tie off and cut your thread, but it's always going to function to finish the pattern you're on and then stop sewing. So to show you what that looks like, I'm going to hit the go button on my machine and it's going to begin to sew one daisy. I hit my pattern end and a stop sign appears and I didn't have to do anything. The machine just stopped at the very end of one flower. 
If I have it programmed to also cut and raise the presser foot, I can do that. Or I can use my snips, pull out my fabric, and I have just one single daisy that's sewn. If I lower my foot and press go again, we'll say that I just stop, but I'm halfway through a daisy. That is when I'm going to get this pattern start button. That's going to appear on the majority of machines only when I am off of the beginning of a flower or a decorative stitch or whatever stitch I'm working on. If I touch that pattern begin, my little circle jumps back to the beginning and I know that I'm going to start at the beginning of a flower and not somewhere in the middle. On the 790 and 880, that pattern begin button is a physical button on the front of the machine. On the other ones, it only shows up when it's able to be activated when I'm not at the beginning of a stitch. So now that we've talked all about decorative stitching and those different features, I want to talk to you about the Bernina Stitch Regulator. It is such a nice tool that comes with many of the machines or is compatible with most of them. Now the Bernina Stitch Regulator is going to actually enable you in free motion quilting to move your hands at whatever pace is natural to you and that machine is going to speed up or slow down depending on what you are, what you're doing. So I really like it because it removes the patting my head and rubbing my stomach kind of feel of trying to time my foot control to speed up and slow down the needle as I'm moving my hands. I am not a natural at free motion quilting. It takes a lot of practice and the BSR enables me to get really nice stitching results and I can just focus on the shapes that I'm making instead of focusing on the speed, the stitch length, all of that. So I'm going to show you how to put on that BSR and talk a little bit about the different modes so that you can practice your free motion quilting at home. So the BSR is a foot for the machine that goes on just like all of the regular Bernina feet. It also has exchangeable soles. So the default sole is this open toe that's going to allow you to have really good visibility to your quilting as you're going. You can change the soles, it comes with two other soles, by pressing on these buttons on either side of the foot and the sole is going to slide right off. You can put whatever sole you'd like back on just by snapping it into place. In order to actually get the foot onto the machine, we're going to disengage our dual feed, pull off the previous foot, and put the little hole right onto the pyramid just like a normal Bernina foot. We lock it into place. The biggest difference is that the cord that you saw is going to have to plug into the back of the machine. And there is a little bit of an icon on the back that looks just like a Bernina stitch regulator and you plug it in. You can tell that it's plugged in correctly because your machine will change and is going to tell you to lower your feed dogs. That's the first step in free motion quilting is make sure those feed dogs are down. Next, you're going to have a different screen than you normally would if you have any other foot on the machine. So it basically has uh, two different modes. The Bernina Stitch Regulator in mode one is going to have what's called a cruise control, where it's going to continue to stitch as long as the BSR is turned on. I personally like to start in BSR two, which is just by touching the two on the screen, because I find as a beginner that it's a little less startling that it's moving when I'm not moving the fabric. So I'm gonna lower my foot and all that I do to get started is I press and hold the go button. And when this red light turns on, the BSR is on. As I move the fabric, it's going to slow down and speed up as I go. When I'm done, I touch the stop button. And right now I have my machine stopping with the needle in the down position, which is why it's stopped down. I like that, especially as a beginner, because then I'm not losing my space, I'm not losing where I am on the quilting, and I can just start again, and it's going to continue this path. BSR2 gives me a little bit more time to think about what I'm doing. BSR1, I'll just show you what that looks like. I'll select stitch one. When I hit go, that machine starts to pulse. And it will continue to pulse as I do sharp corners. It helps me get really nice pointy stars. Otherwise, it acts just the same.
when I'm done, I can use my thread snips just like any other seam. My foot raises and I pull it out. So you can tell I am not a professional free motion quilter, but it is really, really nice to get these even stitches. So I am just focusing on how I'm moving my fabric and the shapes I'm making. It is a lot of fun to play with. So if you have a BSR, get it out, do not be afraid of it, and go ahead and get playing. You may have noticed as I was using the BSR that my go button would flash red and the machine would beep at me sometimes. There is a speed limit to using the BSR. And so if you go a little bit faster than the machine can keep up with, you'll get that feedback and you'll know to slow down. Some people are real speed demons though, and they don't like it to be making those noises at them and kind of, you know, giving them that feedback. So you always have the option of turning off the sound. I also want to point out that you can always adjust the stitch length when using the BSR. So the default is going to be two millimeter stitch length. I can use my multifunction knobs to adjust that target stitch length. I think between a two to a three, anywhere in there is going to be a good length for quilting. 2.5 tends to be the standard for piecing, but you can play with it and see what your preferred stitch length is as you do your free motion quilting. You also have an option in the BSR mode to do a zigzag stitch. This can be really, really fun for doing thread painting or different creative applications. If you really want to show off a thread and show off some decorative creative things that you're doing, the zigzag can be a very fun way to do that with your BSR. One other thing to mention about the Bernina stitch regulator is that you can use your foot control with it. I personally prefer to do uh, the go button like I showed, but if you wanted to use your foot control, just think of it as an on off switch. So either have your foot all the way down and you are on and then all the way off and you're off. The BSR itself is what's going to control the speed of the needle. So don't get confused. Your foot control is not your speed control. It is just your on off button if that's how you wanted to use it. So now that we've talked about editing stitches, we've talked about decorative stitches, combination stitches, we've talked about the Bernina stitch regulator, let's talk a little bit about some of the feet that came with your machine, as well as some of the different techniques that you might like to do with your Bernina. The first foot I want to talk about is the number five foot. This is for a blind hem. A blind hem is a really great way to kind of do a subtle finish or shorten pant legs or whatever it is that you don't want the stitching to show at all, but you do want to be able to hem the pants in a way that is gonna make it stay. There is a guide on this foot that you're going to line right up with a fold and it's going to be the perfect foot to get that blind hem stitch. So I'm gonna put this foot on and show you how to prepare the fabric. I just have a piece of demo fabric here, which is what we use in class. And the blind hem is always going to have two folds to begin. So I just fold in one and you can press it to make sure that it's gonna stay nice and straight. I fold in one more time, and again, I've pressed this so that it doesn't get, you know, kind of come undone as I'm going. And then the last thing is we're going to fold it back on itself to reveal just a little smidge of the hem itself. We're going to use stitch number nine on the machine, which is a blind hem stitch. And you'll see that it is four running stitches that are going to be on this part of the hem, and then a little bite to the left that's going to just bite in to this piece of the fabric. And it's going to result in just a very small, subtle stitch that you are going to really love for hemming different items. So to show you what that looks like, I'm gonna put my fabric right underneath and I'm going to use my guide on the foot to line right up along the fold that I have. When I hit go, I wanna be sure that my straight stitch is on the hem portion and that the bite just catches the fold. At the end of the seam, I'll stop and cut. And you can see that the little bites just barely come in and catch that fold. So when I open it up, I have these very subtle little pieces that are holding that hem closed, but if you matched thread color, you would not be able to see them at all. And there's a blind hem. The next foot that comes with most of your machines is the 2A foot. This is the overlock foot and is really, really good for finishing edges. I have used this foot to make a lot of masks. 
This foot has a small needle that you are basically going to line up with the edge of the fabric and it's going to allow your overlock stitch to really get a good wrap along the edge of the fabric and finish the edge. This is perfect for construction, um, for getting a really nice finished edge that you can use for lots of different things, in particular masks as one example. So I'm going to switch out my number five foot and put on the 2A. And with this, with any of these stitches, you're going to want to customize them depending on exactly what fabric, what type of thread, um, sort of what exact application you are doing. So I like to start with a number three stitch, and then I usually will make it a little bit wider and a little bit shorter than normal. You can really play with this and kind of see what is gonna give you the best results, and you can save your favorites um, or save it into permanently altered memory, sort of however you want to remember those numbers, but you don't have to write them down because your Bernina can remember them for you. I have two pieces of fabric here, and I'm just going to put the edges right together and slide them under my foot. And I want to line that little, that little needle piece up with the edge of my fabric. When I hit go, I'm getting a really nice wrapped edge. And it takes a little bit of practice to kind of get it lined up just right. But whenever I stop and cut, you can see that I have a finished edge that's going to be a lot stronger than just a normal running stitch. Next, I want to talk a little bit about top stitching. One of my favorite feet is the 10D foot. This is the Bernina top stitch or edge stitch foot. And just like the number five, it has a fabric guide in the middle of the foot that's going to allow you to bump fabric right up against the edge. What's nice with this foot though, is that then I can move the needle to the left or the right, and I can get a really nice, clean, crisp top stitch of whatever decorative stitch or just stitching feature that I wanted to showcase on the finished product. So this can be really helpful for if you're making bags and you're putting straps together. So finishing the straps, finishing the bag, um, anything that you want a construction seam that's going to be strong, straight, and is just showing on top of your fabric. To engage my 10D foot, I'll put it on just like normal. And because it is a D foot, I'm going to engage my dual feed. It helps if I raise my presser foot to engage that dual feed. Next, I'm going to use the triple stitch. The triple stitch is number six. This is a straight stitch, but it has a nice bold effect because the machine is going back and forth three times on every stitch. When I lower my foot, I want my fabric to be right up against this fabric guide. My needle is going to default to being right behind the fabric guide. So it's really going to be sewing sort of too close to the edge of the fabric right now. I'm going to bump my needle maybe three positions to the left. You can play with this depending on your project. And when I go, I just need to line my fabric edge up with that guide And my triple stitch is going to show up as a nice, bold line of stitching. When I snip my threads, you can see a bold, clean finish on a strap, on a bag, on whatever project I, I'm doing that I want to get this kind of effect. The last technique that I want to talk about is the quarter inch, which is really important for us quilters and piecers. Bernina has a number 97 foot that's going to cover the feed dogs on the nine millimeter machines. If you have a five and a half millimeter machine, you would use the 37 foot that's going to be the right width to cover your feed dogs on your particular machine. The 97 comes as a D foot as well, which I love to use to engage the dual feed and get very even flat piecing as I'm doing my project. With the 97 foot, you're going to have your needle in the center position and you just line your fabric up with the outside edge to get a perfect quarter inch seam. One really nice stitch feature that you have on your Bernina is to do more of a basting stitch. 
So you can have a stitch length that goes all the way up to six millimeters. So I'm on my straight stitch and I'm just using my multifunction knob to go all the way up to six millimeters. This is available on all of the Berninas that are featured for this video. Some of them, however, also have a long stitch function. The 590, 770, 790, and 880 have a long stitch function that I can access by going into my eye menu and selecting this long stitch icon. That's going to change this basting stitch from a six millimeter up to almost an inch and a quarter long stitch, which is incredibly long, very easy to take out, but very effective at holding quilt layers together or anything that you want to baste and it's not gonna come out until you, you take it out. The last stitch technique that I'm going to talk about is actually sewing on and attaching a button. You have a button sew on program in your machine. It's stitch number 60. When I pull it up, you can see that it's just a straight line right across. This program works very, very well with the number 18 foot. You can see that it has a, basically a little piece that's going to be right where your um, button sits underneath and it's going to do a zigzag just back and forth around that post and that post is what's going to give you enough play to really allow the button to pop into the buttonhole. With this foot you just slide your button underneath and I usually will use my hand wheel, this is about the only time I use a hand wheel, to lower my needle into the left eye and into the right eye. Once I know that my needle is not going to hit that button and it's the right distance apart, I just hit my go button and it's going to go back and forth enough times to make a secure stitch and attach that button without putting too much thread into the stitch. Once it's done, you can cut the thread and you have a button sewn on. So thanks for joining us today to learn a little bit more about the sewing side of your Bernina. I hope that you learned a lot and are able to really engage with all these fun features and functions on your machine.